got a diverse group here of students, alumni, and friends, and we welcome everyone from the various industries. So now I'll introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Dave Goddess joined the Smith School faculty in 2009 after teaching for 10 years at Harvard, Harvard Business School. His teaching experiences include undergraduate, graduate, and executive courses ranging from introduction to marketing to business to business, marketing and sales management. His academic research focuses on two areas, sales management and social networks word of mouth. His work has appeared in top journals like Marketing Science, Management, management Science, and Quantitative Marketing and Economics. He has authored numerous case studies on le leading global firms like FedEx, Avon, XM Satellite Radio, BMW, and IBM, among others. His research and opinions have been cited in a wide range of popular press outlets, in including the New York Times, Forbes, The Economics, and The Boston Globe. He has consulted and or delivered executive education courses to many firms, small and large, located in the US and abroad. Prior to Excuse me. Prior to returning to MIT to pursue doctoral studies, Dave started and ran his own market research and consulting firm, which served a range of clients throughout the Northwest, drawn from banking, mortgage lending, healthcare management, and venture capital. Prior to that, he was a marketing manager in consumer banking. Dave holds a PhD and SM in management from MIT and a BS from economics from the University of Pennsylvania. Please welcome Dr. Dave Goddard. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, okay, it's great to see everybody here. It's particularly exciting to see all, all my, uh, so many of my former students. Uh, had I known that there would be so many here, I would have prepared new jokes. So that's <laughs> a little unfortunate for both of us. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about uh, social media. Uh, I have about an hour, I guess, overall, right, including uh, what I've prepared and uh, leaving time for. Uh, uh, for you all to add, ask any questions. So let me tell you my plan here. So what I'd like to do is uh, begin and really focus my remarks on, um, on three studies that I've done uh, over the past, I guess, 10 years overall um, on uh, social media and more broadly on word of mouth and social networks. So I'll talk about those. Um, you know, feel free to ask any questions you have uh, while I'm talking about it. This should be sort of a two-way thing. Um, and then basically what I'd like to do is open it up for any questions you have. Hopefully I can answer them. I can't promise that I will, but uh, uh, if I can't, maybe somebody else here uh, can answer it. Um, before I do that, what I'm going to do is just note there are, there, there's a set of questions. So I do these things a fair amount, uh, speaking with managers, obviously students as well. And there's like this set of questions I always get asked, you know, that in every, every sort of setting, 90% um, of the time I get asked these four questions. So I'll just begin with those. Uh, if those are on your mind, I'll give you my quick thoughts on them, uh, and, uh, and then again, we'll open it up for, uh, for any general questions. And then what I'd like to do uh, at the end, if I have about five minutes or so, if you can remind me, um, Rosetta, at the end, um, ask for your help um, in uh, sort of furthering our understanding, further, furthering our research in, in this area, okay? So what I want to do is just, uh, as I said, start out and tell you about three studies um, that, that I and, and colleagues have done. Uh, in this um, general area of social media, word of mouth, uh, uh, and, and, and social networks. And so the, the three questions uh, that, that I'll, I'll focus on are, how can you use online conversations to predict um, real, meaningful outcomes in the real world uh, uh, in the future? Um, why do people talk about what they talk about uh, when, they, when, in fact, they do talk? Um, and, and sort of very practical, uh, firm level question, if I could get one more person to talk about my company, my brand, me, um, who would I want that to be? What would I want them to look like? Okay. Um, these are in various stages. Th this was uh, published a number of years ago. This was published uh, last year. Uh, and this, I hope, will be published uh, very soon. I've uh, been working on it a long time. OK, so this question of, um, uh, how do we use online conversations to predict things? So, so I actually started this project an embarrassing number of years ago. So this was, I was a doctoral student. Uh, I was uh, with a feather, uh, fellow doctoral student of mine uh, in, uh, in Cambridge. And, and this, was, this was before you know, anybody had the, this term social media. Uh, this was well before uh, Twitter and Facebook and all. But there were all these online communities emerging where people were talking with each other about stuff, about lots of different things. Uh, and the question we had was, does it mean anything? Is it just noise? Is it just chatter? Or can you really use this in a meaningful way 
uh, to forecast something or predict something? Do, do, is it meaningful, these, th this discussion? And so the context we used to study this was, um, was TV ratings. So we, we gathered uh, all this data on uh, the ratings for TV shows. It wasn't quite that long ago, but it was a fair, <laughs> fair, fair number of years ago. So we gathered all this, this data on, on TV ratings. And we asked the question, could we somehow use these conversations that we're observing online to, uh, uh, to enhance our ability to predict what next week's ratings will be on a TV show? Okay? Uh, and so you can see the challenge, and you know, I use these uh, icons here, of course there was no blog or Facebook or Twitter. Uh, it was Usenet, if anybody remembers Usenet, but that Usenet was the forum or the set of forums in which people were having these conversations at the time. And the question is, can we use that, could we use these conversations to forecast uh, ratings, to forecast how many people will watch these TV shows next week? Um, uh, and, and in fact, do it better than we could do at the time. At the time, the main piece of data that we would have to do this would be last week's ratings. Right? We knew how many people watched it last week or you know, the previous number of weeks. Um, how can we use this data to do better, to forecast? And, and the challenge, I don't know if it's obvious, but the challenge here is that this, these aren't numbers. right? So I, I know, I was taught in graduate school how to take you know, previous numbers and put them into a model and forecast future numbers. That's not that hard has its own challenges, but it's conceptually not that hard. But these are, these are words, right? They're not numbers. Uh, and so the question is, how do, you, how do you transform these conversations into some meaningful measure that you can use to forecast something, something real, something happening in the real world? These are people sitting in their living rooms watching TV. Um, and so the first thing we did, and probably the obvious thing you might be thinking of, is to just count, right? What we, what we could do is we could go out and we could count how many people are talking about um, Hawaii 5 uh, How many people are talking about CSI Miami, right? Uh, at the time, the, in the data set we had, how many people are talking about uh, Malcolm in the Middle, right? Um, and so we tried that. It seemed obvious, but we tried it. We, we, we wanted to know if that would work. And in fact, it didn't work. Okay, and so just the raw counts of conversations, posts about a TV show, had no predictive value in a model of next week's rating. Okay? Uh, and in retrospect, it was fairly obvious why that was, because we already knew how many people watched it the previous week. And so it turns out the number of people posting about a show is a direct function of the number of people who watched it the previous week. Right? So if you imagine, roughly speaking, 10% or 8% of people are going to go online and say something about a TV show. That's a made up number, by the way. Uh, but if it's roughly constant across TV shows, if I know how many people have posted, it doesn't really tell me anything new if I already know how many people watched it. Uh, so we said, OK, well, we have to work a little bit harder. And so we went back and we tried to think through how, number one, how are these social networks structured, these online networks? And more importantly, how information flows through these networks online. And, and, and one of the real fundamental results from um, the research, the years and years of research on social networks, is that information flows very freely within networks. Okay? And so if you know something, your friends are going to know it soon. You may have heard it from your friends. And so the information flows very quickly within networks, but very slowly across networks. Okay? The fact that your group of friends knows something uh, does not necessarily mean that another group of friends that's only loosely connected to your group will know it next week. Right? It flows very slowly. And so using that idea, what we did is we constructed a measure of what we call dispersion or entropy of information or conversations about these TV shows. Okay. And so one way to think about it is we went out and we counted in how many different communities. There are many, you know, hundreds of online communities talking about, let's say, Malcolm in the Middle at the time. But what we counted was in how many of these communities was there at least one conversation going on about Malcolm in the Middle or... Uh, uh, or uh, Angel Hill at the time, lots of different TV shows that don't exist anymore. Um, and so we put that in the model, and it turned out to be wildly predictive of, of next, week's, uh, next week's ratings. Okay? And because, again, the, the, the idea that we're trying to capture here, that we did capture, was that information flowed very slowly um, across networks, but quickly within networks. And so if we could somehow measure where, in how many different communities there was this information, uh, that was predictive of how many people would watch it next week. So sort of an, intuit an intuitive way to think about this is, if I could get 10 people to talk about my research uh, next, uh, next year, uh, excuse me, if I wanted to maximize the number of people that were talking about my research next year, but I could only inform 10 of them today, I'd want to make sure that those 10 people lived in very different networks. They didn't all live in the same network. I, I wouldn't want to tell 10 people at Maryland about my work. I'd want to tell one person at Maryland, one person at UCLA, one person at Chicago. Okay, so that's, that, that was that study. Any questions about that? 
And so this is the, the idea here is, is looking at the firm as, as, the, as a listener of or listener to social media. What should you listen to? How should you, um, how should you use the data? Does it matter what the company of the content is positive or negative? So uh, you may have been a reviewer on this paper. So that was a question that they all asked. <laughs> I didn't hear. Um, and there's actually a big debate um, um, in the academic literature, at least, as to whether or not it matters. So we submitted this paper. The question they asked is, well, of course, you know, the valence would matter. You have to measure the valence. Um, uh, text um, uh, analysis, textual ana analysis was not quite well developed at that time. So we had to hire a slew of graduate students to sit down and evaluate thousands of posts as to whether they're positive or negative. We did that, and it turned out to make no difference. Um, really had no, had no effect. Um, there's a number of other papers that have followed on that show that in some cases it does matter, uh, in some cases it doesn't matter. I wish I could tell you the exact contingency when it, when it does and when it doesn't. It really sort of, uh, to me, gets back to this fundamental question of whether you think of social media or word of mouth uh, more generally as primarily informative or persuasive, right? So is, and, and, and I, I sort of sit in the, in, the, in the first camp, really. So to me, the, the power of um, social networks, the power of social media is in informing people about new ideas. And in that case, the valence doesn't matter quite as much. Um, if people are just trying to decide if this is the right idea for me, then it matters more. But I don't think this, that's what was going on here. Any other questions about this? OK. So feel free to ask questions later on if you have more about that. So then, um, so, so, so as I said, that was, uh, that was one of the first studies I worked on uh, here in, in, in social media. Um, uh, a few years after that, I, I started a project with a, uh, a doctoral student um, at Harvard. And, and the question uh, we, we looked at here was, um, when we sit down with somebody uh, and have a conversation with them, uh, perhaps make a recommendation about a restaurant or a video game or a new job or a school. Um, how do we decide what to talk about? Right? So we have a finite amount of time. Um, we have a near infinite amount of information, amount of things we could talk about. How do we decide what to talk about? Okay? How do we decide what recommendations to make? Should they be positive? Should they be negative, for example? The dominant theory at the time, and, and frankly still today, I think largely, is a view of people as fairly altruistic, as, as sort of making choices about what recommendations to make um, from the perspective of what's most helpful to my friends or my acquaintances. So I call this, I call this the giving tree theory of, uh, of word of mouth, that you know, I sort of decide what to tell people. The people who laughed have kids, right? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so I decide what to tell people based on what I think is going to help them the most. Okay? Um, but it turns out if you, if you think a little bit about your own, you know, you're honest with yourself maybe, or you think about your friends, what they recommend to you, um, it's not clear this is really what's happening. Uh, moreover, if you, if you look at the, this valence question, in fact, um, it doesn't quite work because by and large, I think we could make the argument that from an altruistic perspective, uh, negative recommendations are more helpful than positive ones. In other words, warning somebody not to go to a restaurant because it will kill you is more useful than telling them that they make a great, you know, Fra Diablo or something, right? Um, and so you would think, if, if that was the case, you'd see more negative than positive word of mouth. And, and in fact, empirically, that's just not true. Empirically, we see, particularly online, but we see far more positive uh, recommendations. If you look at reviews on, on Amazon or on Rotten Tomatoes, I mean, ridiculously positive. Uh, so by and large, the word of mouth we see is, is more positive. And so it doesn't quite square with this. And so what we've developed is a theory, a far more selfish theory of, uh, of word of mouth, a far more selfish theory about recommendations. And it's based on the idea of image enhancement. Okay? It's a very simple idea. You know, it's very intuitive that when I sit down and I decide what to talk about, I'm going to talk about things that make me look good to my friends. Okay? So I'm not really being helpful. I'm really choosing. I don't really care, frankly, about the information I'm, I'm talking about. I care about what it says about me. Okay? Uh, and so think about. Uh, the following. So in, in various categories, let's take restaurants as an example, there are people for whom that category is a very important part of their self-image. I want you to think of me as a restaurant expert. And so when we sit and we meet, I'm going to tell you about restaurants, and in particular, I'm going to tell you about positive experiences I had. Because negative experiences don't really shed a very positive light on me, right? They make me look like I can't choose good restaurants. So I want to talk about positive uh, experiences if I'm one of these 
sort of experts, foodies in, in the restaurant category. Uh, and so we've run, I mean, I can't tell you how many experiments, as I said, this isn't quite yet published. We, we, we've run many, many, many studies on this and showed uh, consistently that people uh, for whom that category is important to their self-image, we'll call them experts, um, by and large, predominantly make positive recommendations about that category. Experts talk about positive experiences they had at restaurants. Novices, people for whom this isn't an important category, make an equal number of positive and negative recommendations. Okay? And so the implications here are, um, number one, uh, if you want to influence conversations, if you're hoping to encourage positive recommendations about your product, you really want to focus on the, uh, the experts, right? You want to find people for whom that category uh, is an important part of their self-image. Not true of negative. So if, you're, if your objective is to um, sort of halt the flow of negative word of mouth, uh, to counter negative word of mouth, that's not true. You don't necessarily want to focus on, on the negative people because they're not necessarily your problem. Uh, it's a more mass, uh, mass uh, uh, target for, for a campaign like that. Um, it also says something about um, what your offer is, what your communication is to, your, to the people you're hoping will talk about your product. Um, you don't want to say, you know, help your friends out by making this recommendation. That doesn't, really hasn't been shown to be a powerful motivator. You want to try to appeal to more, you know, to less altruistic, more selfish motives like, you know, tell people about this. It'll demonstrate, you know, your, ability, your discerning taste in restaurants or discerning taste in fashion or movies, et cetera. So appealing to that would be much more, uh, much more effective. Questions about that? Yes. So that, that works even on like sites like Yelp versus and I would understand on Facebook especially because you have your friend here. Mm -hmm. Like for example, I was just in San Diego last week and I was looking on Yelp for recommendations for a good Mexican restaurant. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing how varying they were. I mean you had some that were like, this place is amazing and this is really good, this place is terrible. Mm -hmm. So what I ended up doing was I compared that to another Mexican restaurant that I've been, been to in San Diego. So area, calibrate, sort of. That I think is very good. Mm -hmm. And it also had equal number of positive and negative. So then it kind of, I thought it was kind of surprising that you really can't even depend on it. Especially if it's like a three or four star. If all, all of them are one star or something, you know it's terrible. So but, the, the but variance. In the middle, in the middle yeah. Right. Um, uh, Again, so, so our, 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 the theory here is, is, is on trying to figure out why people, why people are doing it. And so, you know, to the extent that, um, you know, there's equal numbers of positive and negative or something like that, I would suggest that the, that, that, uh, the base of reviewers there is drawn from not necessarily experts, but, you know, sort of a mass group. So I would say that if you focus on experts, you would find uh, far more positive. And in fact, so we, we haven't done the research on Yelp, but we did it on Amazon. And we looked at sort of the expert reviewers, they were significantly more positive on average than sort of the average reviewer on, on, on Amazon. I, I don't know if it's true on Yelp. I, I mean, it's costless for me to say. I'm sure it would be the same. But I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, so? um, when you talk about experts, are you talking, what about, where does the role of people who sort of created their expertise in terms of before blogging, they were really not known, and then they created a blog and developed it? So, I mean, I think that's, the, I mean, that's almost the prototypical person we're talking about here. The person for whom, it, 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 expert is a little bit um, misleading. It's really self-perceived expert, <laughs> right? So seriously, so it's somebody for whom my reputation, I am, I'm, I'm trying to create a reputation. And my reputation in this category is important to me. So I think they would be exactly, exactly what we're talking about. In fact, you, you raise an interesting point that what it suggests is that when I go out and I maybe try to do analysis on and try to figure out you know, who exactly are the eight people in this room that uh, I want to focus on to get out the positive uh, word about my, my restaurant or, or business, um, it suggests that it matters more what I care about myself than what others care about me. Right? So there are, um, you know, there are different ways to do this, uh, uh, to measure influence. And some people believe you should ask other people to evaluate who's most influential in, your, in their group. This would suggest that's not the right way to do it. It's really about how I see myself and do I see myself, my reputation in this category is important to me, to my image. So are you saying that let's say if I want to wear a computer and if I go to a website like CNET, yep. which is considered to be the expert uh, I guess in electronics, so you're saying that they may not give me, uh, they may not tell me the, uh, all the negatives about something that I'm buying, electronics in this case? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, well, I'd love to claim that the, the theory covers everything. I, I think it doesn't. It really speaks to interpersonal 
discussions far more than sort of professional, you know, critics almost. Uh, I, think, I think it probably doesn't extend so well to that. M much more, when you sit down with your friend, what does she talk about? Somebody here. Does, does the role of sort of the self-perceived expert transcend <coughs> into venues of anonymity? So for instance, on the web, a lot of times, you're posting a comment, and particularly, I think, when a lot of companies have <coughs> Facebook pages, people are posting comments, and maybe it's not their real name, or on Twitter, it's not their real name, or on a, cool. you know, if Amazon. Certainly it's on Amazon. Amazon. Yep. And so, sort of, what's the difference between that <coughs> and, you know, a face-to-face -face conversation where you're recording? I think it's much more, this theory is much more uh, powerful, uh, certainly face-to-face, but um, in online context in which people are using their real name. Because again, the, the, the idea here is that um, I'm trying to build a reputation. And so to the extent that it's not even my real name, if you know, I'm doing an Amazon review, I don't even leave a name, I can't build a reputation. So it would be more powerful on Facebook than it would be on Amazon. I guess it would. I guess it would. You know, so again, we, we, we've studied Amazon because you can get the data. Uh, and we found that it was stronger when people use their real name. Uh, so, you know, because you, you can verify your real name in Amazon with a credit card. Um, it, it still worked when people used a pseudonym. It didn't work when people didn't use a name. Use a name, use a name right? So, uh, which I think is sort of what you would predict, right? Yeah. Uh, um, and you know, to the it, and Facebook to the extent that in general, not always, right? But in general, people are more likely using their real name. It ought to be more. more powerful. So, from the standpoint of trying to get your positive message out, back to your example, or you've written a new research paper and you yeah. want to get it out to the world. <laughs> So from what you said before, you want to get somebody, you want to get someone from every different university, and you want to get the self-perceived experts from every Same different. Say in that category, right, in, exactly right. In that particular category. Right, right. And that's the best way to get your message out of your new product or your new theory. I mean, I hate, I, you know, I'm just trying to be a little careful about best way. I, I think, right, I, I think this this is that, the, 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 to, to the extent that your objective is that it will multiply m most broadly, right? You know, holding constant all kinds of things about what the, the incentives you have to give or what, what have you. But their motivation to talk about it will be significantly higher, assuming that it's good, um, than the average person, right? Uh, and then going back to the first one, uh, and um, once they talk about it, they're more likely to tell people that haven't heard about it if they're if they're dispersed. Right. So I think Pradeep had a question. Or no? If in a community, I don't want to cold call people here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for some, uh, if there, if these comments were being put forward in a community where it is important uh, to be perceived as an expert, has uh, let's say seen it, for example, among engineers coming from an engineering background, know that uh, you know you want to be able to stand in the hallway uh, of a company and you know, talk proudly and talk as if you were an expert. Uh, on a certain topic. Mm -hmm. Has that been measured or tested for in any sense or fashion? So, so the context you're describing, how is it different from like the, just the example, the restaurant example I gave? Well, so it's more important. Example, the restaurant example is, um, is more generic in the sense that it's applicable to a larger audience. Okay, okay. A, Expert opinion on the Intel i5 <coughs> core chip is more nuanced. So I was wondering if. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's hard for me to say. I mean, I know as an engineer, you think engineers are much more special. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I, it's, it, I can't answer that. Uh, I haven't. I'm, I'm trying to think if we've done anything that was even close. We did do, so we replicated, most of our experiments were in restaurants because, right. you know, most, ex most academic experiments are run on students. Uh, that's an unfortunate fact, and so they like restaurants. We ran it on, with digital cameras, so a little bit more technology focused, um, and same result, um, same main result. Um, uh, it was more of a consumer standpoint, not necessarily. Right, it's still, it was still consumer, it was still consumer. Yeah, I, we've not run it, you know, then we did this thing on Amazon, but we've never run it with sort of professional, you know, the, the, the fact is you'd have to pay them too much to, to be willing to go through the experiment. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't see intuitively why it would be different, but I can't say that I've shown it. So a lot of us are here to try to figure out how to use social media sure. best for our companies and obviously put that positive light on, communicate that. Going back to your example of the restaurant industry, yep. give an example so I can understand, you know, what your comment and where you're coming from. 
new a new restaurant opens in the area six months ago. Are you saying that it's cut new customers are more likely to go there <coughs> from the professional reviewer in the Washington Post who reviews that restaurant and mm -hmm. makes comments about it, or commentary from online community friends, people who who make recommendations, positive or negative. Is there one that's more likely to be, um, a, you know, promoting success for your business or getting the word out for your business? So it it, would, it really speaks to the latter and it speaks to differences within the latter. So, so it really doesn't speak to critics. So critics, okay. again, sort of fall in that professional group. It's a little, a little bit different. We're trying to speak to motivation here. Critics' motivations are quite different, right? Um, so it speaks to the latter. So, so the average customer, and it's saying that conditional on a group of average customers coming and conditional on all, all of them having a great experience, the ones that are going to be more motivated to talk about it are the ones who uh, perceive themselves as experts in the category. Mm -hmm. If they all came and had a negative experience, there would be no difference. So just the average person, the experts and non-experts would have the same, the same motivation to talk about it. Okay. It also says that if you own the restaurant and you have a list of the people who came, um, and let's somehow you could identify who might perceive themselves to be the experts, that your communication to them in terms of encouraging them to talk more about it uh, should be around, you know, uh, you know, you had the ability to identify this new restaurant. You, you can identify the sort of the, the subtlety of our, our chef's cooking style. You know, tell your friends about that. And, you know, that'll, that'll say something about your expertise to your friends as opposed to here's a coupon, help your friend out. People aren't, aren't motivated that way. How would we identify these uh, people who want to enhance their images in the first place? You said that people who want to enhance their images will generally put out positive reviews, but doesn't necessarily hold that the people who usually put out positive reviews are these people who want to enhance their images. Say that again. So, so oh, you're saying so? So, one question you asked, right? So, is are people who are predominantly positive? Does it go the other way? Does it go the other way? Does it go the other way? How would we identify these? Yeah, I mean, we, we do it through surveys. You know, we do it through through, through self-reporting. Um, the, identif the, the identification of influence is uh, is very difficult. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of uh, so so again. So the quick answer is we did we did surveys. Uh, I keep hitting this mic, right? I, I apologize for that. Uh, this, he's wincing every time. Um, <laughs> um, there's a company. Um, I'm trying to remember who it was. Uh, Lee, Lee Jeans um, uh, did did a did a campaign where they um, they wanted to drive young men into the uh, into stores. Um, they they didn't have any traffic in young men, so they created a video game, uh, and they were ho in hopes that people would share the video game among them. Uh, and so what they did was they went into online gaming communities and used uh, measures like. Um, you know, who posted a lot, who, who started threads as opposed to who followed threads, whose comments were uh, responded to, and so they use that as uh, proxies for expertise in, in, those, in those, uh, those categories. So I can't say they're optimal, I mean it was a wildly successful program, um, and so it would seem, you know, sort of relatively in line with this idea of identifying, identifying experts, but from a sort of a uh, you know, a passive data as opposed to um, survey approach. Um, just along those lines, when I go and I read reviews, the ones that I put more credibility in are the ones where the person says, I have X amount of experience doing this, or I, I've tried all these different brands, and this is why I like this particular one. And so what I find is that they're more highly detailed, mm -hmm. um, and they give more um, information about the person as an individual yeah. and where they're coming from. Sure, sure. You're, I, I agree completely. And so you're, so what we're studying here is sort of the sender. You know, what is, what, what is the sender's motivation? You're talking about the receiver. What, is, what kinds of reviews, what kinds of recommendations have more impact? Um, and your experience is exactly uh, has been demonstrated in, in, in the academic literature. So, for example, there are studies that show that um, uh, um, uh, reviews that are written correctly, like grammatically correct, that don't have misspellings, have a bigger impact than those that don't. There have been studies that show uh, so that um, you know demonstrating that you're careful, you're thoughtful in terms of expertise or, or uh, willingness to share information. Studies have shown this is not my work, but but others. Um, that uh, if I share where I'm from, uh, how old I am, so personal information, those recommendations are more, more impactful. 
Um, and so that, that's sort of a, a looking at it from the perspective of the receiver versus the sender, but your experience seems completely consistent with that. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. So I, I see on your screen you've got why, what, and when, but what about where? So how do you determine <laughs> where your audience is, or is there a process to figure out how to find out where your target audience is and then go there? So what do you have in mind? Do you mean like online versus offline, or at home versus at work? The gentleman said earlier, you know, he wants to understand how to use social media to build his business. Sure. You need to build a business with people that are ideal target market for you. How do you determine where that target market hangs up? Um, I mean, that, so, so that's sort of a, a marketing question. You know, even, even if this was held 10 years ago, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with social media deciding who your, who your target market is. But you're saying the next step is, once I've decided that you know, I want people who love Italian food and are between the ages of 18 and 34 and live in DC, you want to know what, where they are. What's the process to figure out where they hang out? So I can, you know, they live on Facebook, they live on LinkedIn, they live on, you know, oh, I where, see. where do they hang out? How do you find I see, I see, I see. Um, so my answer to that is, um, and I was actually going to address this a little bit later on, but I think um, one of the things I would recommend, uh, I mean, I don't know of any process. So the quick answer is I'm not sure. But, um, <laughs> but trying to get it closer to something I think I can answer um, is um, I think it's important to not, th and I'm not saying you are, but not think about social media as, as media almost. In other words, so, so, so those of us over 40, uh, and who've, who have been marketers for a while, and I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying I am, um, think of, of media as very substitutable. So in other words, we think, okay, so I have my target market, and my question is, which magazine do they read? Uh, and I want to talk to them in that, through that magazine, right? I want to advertise to them in Sports Illustrated versus Popular Mechanics or, or whatever. And I don't think that's the right way to think about social media. So, because people pr pretty much go to Popular Mechanics and Sports Illustrated for the same thing, we just have different tastes. And I don't think that's true uh, on social media. So people, consumers by and large, use most of the platforms, okay? But they use them for different things. So they use Facebook for different things uh, than they use uh, Twitter uh, for different things than they read blogs or go to YouTube. Uh, and so I go to, and so if you think about it, there are, there are at least sort of three different uh, uses or, or objectives, motivations I have as a consumer to use social media. I want, I want content, right? So I, I go to blogs. I read blogs for content. I want to connect with people. I want to connect on, on Facebook, for example. And uh, so this third motivation I, I refer to as curation. So I want curation. I want somebody to tell me what's important, right? So I want, I want, I want to know what's happening. I want to know the infinite amount of things on, online which I pay attention to. And so I, I, Twitter, I think, is a very valuable tool for that. And there are other, others as well. Um, and so my point is, I wouldn't think, I, I, I would strongly suggest you not think that I want to, should I go to Facebook or Twitter? They're not in any way substitutes, right? They are, they're really complements. They're used in different ways by, um, by the same people. And so I think it's important to get out of this mindset of, um, of thinking of, of social media as substitutable media. It doesn't answer your question, I, I, I understand. But, but, but what, what I recommend to people is that when they, an, when they address this question, which is what should I do, right? You know, I really want to do something now, what should I do? The first thing you want to do is think about how active do I want to be? Do I want to just listen? Do I want to influence? Do I want to engage with the audience? Sort of how, how active do I want to be? And then once I decide that, I, my strong suggestion is you, that you formulate platform level strategies for each of the major platforms. In other words, you don't say we're going to go to Twitter, see how it goes, and then next year we might consider Facebook. They're not, they're not you know, substitutes like that. You want to formulate a sort of a content strategy, a, again, a curation strategy, a connection strategy that would include, and you might not be active in each of those, but you want to consider how each of these things fit together. I know it's not a, a, in any way a direct answer to your question, but, but I guess I'm, I'm saying I don't sort of buy the question so much. I, I think the strategy sits, strategy sits above this choice of, of platform. But we can talk more after. And, uh, but but I can't, I'm not going to get much more specific. So. Well, when I heard your question, what I was picturing is not so much which one 
Twitter versus Facebook as much as when you were talking about people talk more within a network right. than outside networks. So I was picturing it more in terms of network. You know, like within, let's say, Facebook or whatever, there's many networks. Mm -hmm. So how do you choose which network, or how do you find? Was that with more what you were? Well, looking I don't have to get? choose that, right? I mean, so so if, so if I like, want to, how do I get into each one of these networks? How do I, I find them? How do I identify them? How do I know which ones are right for me and that kind of thing? So I kind of picture. Yeah, it I don't. I don't know. I mean, yeah, the, you minimize the amount of time you're spending. I mean, if you're coming to a ne uh, an event to network, yeah, yeah, I would yeah. want my target audience yeah. to be all the people that maybe I would want to have as customers, <laughs> as opposed to. Maybe one person <coughs> in the entire audience. That's not a whole lot of valuable time spent. I'd rather sure. go to a to population rich environment sure. that will minimize the time I spend, you know, whatever. Yeah, but, <laughs> but again, I think that's sort of a traditional media view of thing. You're looking for, again, what is the mag? It's really the, the analog of what's the right magazine to advertise. I don't want to advertise in all magazines. I want to advertise in the one where my customers are. And you know, how, how do you figure that out? It, it's just, so you can, I mean, actually Facebook is a pretty good, you can treat Facebook to completely contradict what I just said, as my students know, I do this all the time. Um, you know, you can, you can think of Facebook in fairly traditional media terms, and, and it, for some businesses it has been, uh, you know, fairly useful in that sense. So you can, you can advertise on Facebook, and you know, this is, I, I forget how many criteria they give you now, 30 something, whatever criteria. You want to put you know, ads on the side, and you can select by interest or uh, what companies they're a fan of, or something like that. So, you know, fairly straightforward, very traditional. Uh, ways, but that's not to me. That's not really social right, media. Right. And I, yeah, and I wasn't so much thinking about it in terms yeah. of advertising that yeah. kind of thing. It's more of you know, getting into those networks, watching who's saying what, yeah. finding the expert by the way they're talking, the right. way they're you know what they're saying, and then based on what you were what you sure. were talking about here, and then planting a seed with that person or interacting with that. person. Sure, sure. But again, you know, and I would go back a little bit to my, you know, to my answer to, to Steve's question. You know, there, there are you know, firms who specialize this in this, and there are people who do it. Where, so for example, just look at the clout, clout score, right? So, so, which is basically looking at, who, you know, who tweets them, who, whose tweets are retweeted, you know, who has you know more followers than people they're following. So there are metrics you can use at an aggregate level to say, to identify people who are more influential than others using these social network type measures. Um, but I think it stops well short of identifying at the network level, you know, who's in this network versus that network. Um, I think that's a fair, you know, on a, on a platform with 600 million people, a fairly difficult thing to do. To be, you know, I'm just being, being honest. Yeah. When you talk about metrics, have there been any return on investment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cases where they so the great thing about this, <laughs> as I said, there are these questions I always get asked, and uh, so so far we've got two of them, so this is good. So maybe we we keep talking, we'll get all. Of them. Yeah. So um, so okay. So my answer to that is, and nobody likes my answer to this. Uh, not not you've liked the other answers, but this this answer, I don't buy this question, right? So so to me, uh, and I'll generalize what I don't buy, and not, and I'll try to answer your question specifically, but. There's like all this hand wringing about measurement that uh, you know we can't invest in social media until we can measure. How are we going to measure social media? It's so hard to measure. I mean, my answer to that is how do you measure traditional media, right? I mean, um, if you look if you look at measurement as sort of this two stage thing, so I can measure what what I'm delivering, maybe the impression level or something like that, right? Uh, and and then there's the measurement of the impact uh, afterwards. What is it doing for me? Um, I don't see any significant difference between how I measure social media uh, on either of these dimensions as compared with traditional media. So, I mean, so let's just take TV. So I know, I mean, theoretically, I know the number of impressions. I know theoretically how many people are in the room. But you know, I can see uh, how, uh, how many people retweeted a tweet. I can see how many people like my uh, like my content that I'm posting on our fan page. I can I can measure how many fans we have. So I can see the impressions just as well and just as noisy. I mean, none of them are perfect. And I can measure the impact just as noisy, I mean, in, just as ineffectively, I guess I would say. I don't really know when I run a TV ad what happened. I mean, I can run a before after study. I can run an AB, uh, you know, split study. I can compare, pair up cities and, you know, see what's going on. But none of those are perfect. Uh, and so, 
to answer the question you didn't necessarily ask, I think people get far too worried about the measurement aspect of social media as compared with traditional media. I don't think it's any any worse, any better. Right. And from a word of mouth, yeah, yeah. where you want to get it out there, yeah. and you're going to hire someone as a little marketing coordinator to go, you know, blog or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's more on the lines of you can't ignore it, but you put someone in there designated to do it. Right. Is there anything that supports that this word of mouth is a is instrumental to in your marketing for an organization? That has an impact. Yes. Uh, so, so let me make sure. I, so, so like a systematic study that showed that more tweets led to more sales. You're saying is it, it would be an example of something that would make you happy. Um, so there's been tons of res academic research. You know, there, there's many case studies, obviously, but um, in terms of academic research, there have been many studies um, on. On, like the review site level, so better reviews on Amazon lead to more book sales, right? Uh, the study I talked about with ours, you know, more conversations about a show led to more uh, higher viewership of that TV show. Um, I haven't seen, again, I'm speaking of academic research, I haven't seen, you know, uh, any Twitter uh, or Facebook studies, uh, or, you know, specific ROI studies on, on that stuff. Um, I'm trying to think here. Yeah, so, so most of the studies I've seen have been at the review site level. And the reason is it's very simple, just easy data uh, and lots of data. Um, lots of research on movies, you know, showing the you know, reviews of movies, the conversations about movies lead to higher box office. Um, you know, to the point that I actually wrote a paper a few months ago saying that enough with, the, there's just too many studies. Like, too many studies that are doing the same thing, saying that X causes Y, that, that word of mouth or social media causes sales. And, I think we sort of all buy it, although maybe we don't all buy it. Uh, and to me, it's more of how, you know, what are the moderators? What, what type is better? And you know, how, do you, how do you drive the kind that you want to drive? But maybe, maybe not everybody. Well, no, from my perspective, maybe yeah. what buys on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure that you're, you know, right. Whether you buy it or not is not necessarily as relevant as to everybody's doing it. Right, right. And so um, uh, just to, to jump ahead to my, my last slide, so, so what I'm going to ask. So how much time do we have? We have till 45, right? We have a little bit longer. Okay. So um, you know, so so these types of studies are hard to do, right? So so you'd like to be able to say, well, um, a Twitter strategy that looks like this is more impactful than a Twitter strategy that looks like this, right? That would be a nice study to do. Here are ten different strategies. Um, you know, more of a content building or comment strategy, what have you, is going to have a different impact on awareness or or liking for a brand, for example. But it's hard to do as an academic. And so I would ask anybody here who's interested in, in doing it and willing to, to, to sponsor, and I mean sponsor from a, uh, a time and effort perspective, not necessarily uh, paying, uh, but, but partner up with academics, either me or we have many other people doing this kind of work, um, that would be great. Because we, these are the types of studies we do need to do, and they're hard to do on our own. And so we need, we need partners with, uh, uh, with firms that are interested in learning about how to um, you know, how to uh, uh, craft a, a social media strategy and sort of willing to apply, the, you know, the rigor that we have to apply from an academic perspective. So that's my closing uh, a little bit early. So, uh, and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll show you some specific questions that I'd love to, uh, to study. Um, I put the clicker down somewhere. Oh, thank you. Any other questions on this? Um, okay. All right, so this last study that I wanted to talk about really gets to, um, in a very specific way, this question of, as, as a firm, what should I do? Uh, so imagine I'm putting together a campaign, uh, and I want people to talk about my product, uh, talk about my brand. Um, who should that person be? Wh whom, should I, whom should I target? We've already talked about uh, expertise, but what we're thinking about here is, um, what should their relationship be with the firm? Should I really focus on my you know, base of loyal customers or not? Uh, and so I have, so the question is, you know, if I want people to talk about University of Maryland, should I go for these crazy, loyal fans of Maryland, right? If I wanted them to talk more, or should I find new customers uh, to, my, uh, to my brand, right? And so we'll assume he can talk uh, 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 or not. So, so the question is, you know, if, if, I, if I'm starting, or if I'm not starting, if I have an existing restaurant, 
and I want to get people to talk more about it, should I ask the people who come every Saturday night or my less loyal customers, my newer customers? And so to study this, this is an example of a, of a project that we did in conjunction with actually two firms. Uh, so we, we did this study with a, a, a chain called Rock Bottom uh, and a, a, an agency called Buzz Agent. Has that, everybody heard of Buzz Agent? Know who Buzz Agent is? So Buzz Agent is basically a panel of people. It's well over half a million people now that you can rent essentially to talk about your brand. Um, there, and there are other panels like them, but uh, P&G has, has a couple of them as well. Um, so they call it, you can learn about them at buzzagent.com. But anyway, so um, I'm not affiliated with the company. Uh, so, um, so what we did is we uh, used a set of their agents who went out and talked about this restaurant, uh, Rock Bottom, in uh, 16 different markets. Uh, and then we also, and so they, they were people who I think 85% of them had never even heard of Rock Bottom before. So not at all loyal customers. Okay. Um, and then we also used, um, uh, we, we got access to the loyalty card program at, at Rock Bottom. And so we identified um, about 500 uh, loyal customers for Rock Bottom who were willing to also participate. So we basically had two people, two sets of people, loyal customers who were talking about the product and non-loyal customers, less loyal customers talking uh, about the product. They went out and for about three months talked about the product, told their friends, acquaintances, strangers, coworkers, whatever, relatives about the product. They reported back to us um, every time they told somebody who they told, whom they told, uh, what their relationship was, what they said. Um, and then on the back end, we tracked changes in sales at each store uh, so we knew uh, how many conversations occurred in Boston. We could see what the changes in sales were in Boston. We knew how many conversations occurred in, in Topeka, Kansas, and then we could see what the changes in sales were in Topeka, Kansas. And importantly, we knew what the relationships were between the people. And so what we found um, was that uh, the most impactful, and we're talking financially now, change in sales, conversations occurred um, by, or were started by less loyal customers. Really, in, in that case, in that example, uh, in, in the one with the, the buzz agents, completely non-loyal customers, customers with no connection to the, to the firm. Uh, and so some people find this a little bit counterintuitive, but it's really not. And so the, the basic idea is that, look, if I'm, you know, if I'm one of these people, you know, imagine me as one of them, right? <laughs> um, I've already told all my friends, right? So I talk about Maryland all the time. I go to all the games, and I talk about it all the time. And so they've already heard about it, right? And they're sick of hearing about it, right? Um, so, so on one hand, so they talk about it. The, the, other, the other thing going on is that there's this concept in social networks that's been around for a long time called homophily, which is this, uh, this idea that we, we tend to live in networks with people that are very much like us. You know, we're friends with similar people, right, who know the same thing, who read the same newspapers, who watch the same TV shows. Um, and so if I'm like a really big customer of Rock Bottom, my friends probably are too. And the ones that don't like Rock Bottom, they've probably tried it. Again, I've been talking about it, and they just, they just don't like it. And so one more conversation by a loyal customer, you know, if I could pay somebody to talk more, and I, I pay a loyal customer to talk one more time about it, it has no impact. In fact, in our, in our set, data set, had zero statistical impact on, on sales. Uh, because the people they're talking to, they already know about it. And it gets back to this, this point about whether you think of word of mouth as persuasive or informative. From an informative perspective, there was no impact. But if you could get uh, a new customer you know, who doesn't have a strong connection to your firm to talk one more time about your, 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 your brand, your product, your firm, whatever, uh, massive impact. So we, we demonstrated a huge financial impact for each new conversation that was started by a non-loyal customer. Okay? Uh, we, uh, w one second. So, so we showed it was true for, again, buzz agents who had no connection to the firm. Uh, then we looked at it by... Um, uh, how, how often they came to the, the restaurant, and we found that you know, the people who came like every week, those conversations had no impact. If they came once every couple of months, the conversations had a little bit of impact, but still not nearly as much impact as, as the buzz agent, somebody who had no, uh, no connection to the firm. Um, the, the reviewers didn't buy our story, so we replicated it in a lab experiment, uh, again, with students, uh, people who were uh, fans of certain websites uh, loved, you know, uh, forget the slash dot and Google. You know, people are really, really big fans. Had them make recommendations to uh, to their friends, and we compared those recommendations to 
recommendations by people who weren't really fans of the, of the website, massive impact of the latter, very little impact of the former. Again, for the same reasons I discussed. Okay, so again, bottom line is if I can get one more person to talk about my, my product, I want to focus on people, clearly not people who hate my product, uh, but people who are somewhat less loyal, aren't the most rabid, rabid customers. The, the people that aren't loyal, I mean, can you talk about the process a little bit? I mean, do they go to the restaurant? What do they talk about? So, um, so you're pointing out an important point, important fact in the study that the loyal customers talk a lot more about it, right? In fact, part of the mechanism we're describing is because they already talk, talk more about it. And so, so I wouldn't say that you want people who don't like your product. They have to know enough about the product. And that's why we focus really on new customers. So focusing on people who had a good experience but are relatively new to the brand, they're really the valuable uh, creators of word of mouth. So they talk, I mean, to answer your question, they talk about the same thing. Um, maybe not quite as deeply, but the important thing is that the people that hear those conversations are far more likely to never heard of, have heard about the product than would be the case if they were, new, new, uh, they were loyal customers. Are these, uh, these non-loyal customers, are they acting as brand ambassadors? Like, they're like, oh, I went to Rock Bottom, the food is amazing, the service is incredible, or are they just giving, yeah, I went to Rock Bottom, you know, that's it, they uh, try it out. Like, what's, what's the scope of the conversation? Are they being kind of told like a script to tell their friends? Or are they like okay, are they uh, being positive, or are they just being honest? Uh, so we believe they're being honest. So we, we have, so I mean, you're asking a question both about the study and, and, and Buzz Agent in general. So, so, so Buzz Agent claims that they encourage people to be honest. Um, of course, their business isn't going to be very successful if their main goal is to spread negative word of mouth about their customers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we, you know, we have the, the, what they told us they said. You know, I, I can't, I don't know, we're going on their word, word for it. Um, we, you know, they don't get paid. You know, they, they get these little rewards for, in fact, for submitting the reports. Uh, but they don't get paid if they tell more people or anything like that. So there's not a big incentive to lie about it. Um, they do report examples of, um, you know, of negative, if, you know, negative word of mouth people. If you didn't like it, you should tell us and them uh, that you didn't like it. Um, but I, by and large, you should, I think you should think of it as, as, as positive word of mouth. I don't think it's glowing, though. And again, I think it, it, it's, it's informing new people about the existence of a restaurant they might want to go to. I don't think it's selling somebody right. on... So it's like a normal interaction. It's not like you got, you know, like these, like a similar conversation that Dyer would have about how it's the best place ever and you got to go there. It's, it's not like that. No, no. It's, it's really, again, it's just, hey, have you heard? Uh, not, you know, you have to go to this, have to go to this place. And again, the lab experiment we did was just a, an email you know, you should check out this website. Uh, in fact, we wrote the emails. We just had them decide who, whom to send it to. Uh, so just check out, slash, check out slash dot, you'll love it. You know, so, uh, so it, was, it wasn't glowing. So I, I, I don't think of it as very persuasive. It's more informative. It's, you know, something I hadn't heard about before. Any other, any other questions about that? Okay, so, uh, so let me just quickly summarize here then. Uh, so how do we use online conversations to predict actual outcomes? The, the key point we, we made here is really focusing on the dispersion of information, uh, how spread out, in how many communities, uh, uh, platforms, uh, groups, networks, is there a conversation? Why do people talk? They talk to enhance their image. Um, and if I could get one more person to talk about my brand, you want to focus on the less loyal or newer, uh, or newer customers. Uh, again, not the people who hate us. Okay, so, um, so I wanted to move on. So we have about 15 minutes uh, for, for Q&A, and I just wanted to head off a few questions. But I guess we've already hit on a bunch of them. So we already talked about this, right? How do I justify, uh, or I, I did my, uh, stood up on my soapbox. I think it's, it's, a, it's a canard. I, I don't buy this when people get so upset about measurement. Does anybody have any questions about that? So my main point here is just that, you know, I, I think, it, I think you know, not investing in social media because you're worried about the measurement issue is just sort of a bad excuse, uh, I think. And, and, you know, certainly it's new um, and, and it's, it's different and, and different principles apply to success in social media and, and traditional, traditional marketing. But the measurement reason is not a good, good reason, in, in my opinion. See? So, I, not that I disagree, but how you are you convincing? Just, no, I, I don't know. <laughs> but how are you convincing people that they should 
invest resources in social media? How am I convincing those who are not in my department who don't necessarily study, or those in my department who don't see yeah, you know, I mean, the great thing about my job is I don't have to worry about these details. <laughs> you know, I guess, you know, ask them how, you know, how is what they're doing today from a measurement perspective any, any different? Um, um, you know, and I've had these discussions with, with CMOs, you know, saying, you know, show me how you measure the effectiveness of your TV campaigns. And again, they do a before, after. They have, you know, um, longitudinal studies that look, you know, um, uh, uh, brand evaluations, awareness, uh, aided awareness, unaided awareness, and you can do the exact same thing uh, with investments in, in, in social media. Uh, so I, you know, so I, I would ask it that way. You know, uh, one response to that could be that, uh, you know, if all else is equal, I'm comfortable with, with traditional marketing, why should, I, uh, why should I change? But, you know, clearly there's so many other opportunities that it, that it, that it makes available to you. Uh, the upside is, is massive, and if the cost is not that different, um, from a measurement perspective, it, it, you should try it. I, it may not be compelling for some, some CMOs. Any other questions about this? Okay. Um, let's see here. So some people uh, often ask about this, um, and I guess a little bit l less recently, but you know, what has changed? And I think um, typically people focus on the promotional aspect of it. So if you think of marketing or, or the, the marketing implementation is the four Ps, right? Uh, and, and, and I think the P that most people focus on is promotion, that, and, and certainly that's the case. And, and certainly the opportunities and um, flexibility and creativity one can use through social media is, you know, in some ways, you know, vastly uh, expanded our range of uh, our, our degrees of freedom as compared with what traditional marketing uh, affords us. So, you know, so lots of changes in promotion, but I think the change a massive change that people don't talk about and maybe don't recognize as much that I think 10 years from now as we look back and ask what did social media really change um, is, is the product. And so you know, one, of the, one of the takeaways that, so I, I teach this, um, this two-day course uh, in our mini MBA program on social media marketing, uh, and one of the, the key takeaways we always uh, develop uh, during that is uh, how important it is to just, I mean it seems intuitive, just have a good product. You know, if you ask, you know, how do we, um, uh, how do we uh, deal with negative word of mouth? Or, you know, uh, you know what do we do when, uh, you know, networks start talking, about, uh, talking poorly about us or we get bad ratings on Yelp or something like that? Um, you know, more than ever, it's critical to have a, a good product. Uh, and so I would, I would predict that, again, 10 years out, as we look back, uh, we'll be able to see a significant improvement in, in product quality, uh, in service quality, as compared with the way things were. You could get by... Uh, being sort of mediocre in the past, this, that's just not true anymore. Uh, and so before thinking and worrying about how am I going to promote my stuff differently, I think you have to think about how, how do you first make sure that my product is, is good enough to be promoted through these, uh, through these methods. Yeah, that's my, my, any, any comments on that? Uh, for some reason, I always get asked this question, and I don't know why, uh, but how are women different from men in terms of social media? So people want to know, do women talk more uh, uh, online, or uh, you know, the, the examples, the, the studies I talked about, do, um, you know, do loyal women, or do they act differently from loyal men, or et cetera, or you know, the motivations, is there a significant motivation different? And, and because I'm always asked this question, in every study I've ever done, I've looked for these gender effects, and I've never found anything. Uh, and I would love to write a paper about it, but I've just never, never seen a thing. Uh, so there have been these studies uh, years ago that, that show that women's social networks are different from men's. I mean, there's no question about that. And so um, I, I mentioned homophily a second ago, that this idea that we ten tend to live in, in social networks with people like ourselves. That's particularly true of men, less true of women. So women tend to live in social networks uh, characterized by more variety. Uh, in the people, their, their ties. Their, their ties are more different from them than men's ties are different from, from them. For, and you, whatever, who knows why. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure many of you know why, or have theories on why, I don't know why, but it just it is what it is. But in terms of social media and word of mouth and use of networks and the way information flows and motivations, um, I found absolutely no differences. And you know, I wish I would, uh, it would be a great paper to write, but I found nothing, so. The answer is they don't, they, they aren't, they're not different. Any, any questions, comments? 
observations with, of disagreements? I found that one hard to believe. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> if you have a theory, please tell me. I would love to investigate it. But I, again, I, you know, I, every study I run, I just I ask gender, and I just look well, at. In our world, we sell plumbing fixtures, bath fixtures, and we find that the women, nine percent of the decision is made by the women, the final decision. So I'm sure that's true. No, no, but but. Do they say different things to their friends? Do they make different types of recommendations? Do they talk more about more positive things than negative things as compared with men? We found none of that. No, I'm sure from a decision-making process, and you know, they buy different things certainly, but within you know, holding constant the categories, we don't, we don't see any differences. Yeah, yeah disappointing. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I've already talked about this. So, so, so in terms of you know, what, um, you know, what, what you should do, um, you know, my, uh, I, I said, you know, the first thing I would do is, is think about these roles. And so, um, you know, think about, you know, do I want to be a li at, a, at the firm level, do we want to be a listener? You know, do, do we want to sort of sit back and see what we can learn from uh, social media? Um, so the next role, the next most active role is, uh, do I want to be an influencer? Do I want to go out and try to Encourage more positive uh, conversations. Discourage negative conversations. You know, uh, you know. Uh, encourage discussions in certain types of networks versus others. Do I want to influence? And then finally, do I want to be a participant? Do I want to engage, uh, engage my customers, engage the marketplace, sort of in this two-way, two-way conversation? To me, that's the sort of the, the strategic level decision. The next decision, which, which, again, which I've already mentioned, is recognizing that the, these platforms are used for different purposes. We've already talked about this, that you want to think of sort of content, uh, crafting a content strategy, a connection strategy, and a, and a curation strategy. And, and that's going to be true regardless of the role you play. Right? And so to recognizing that, for example, if, I'm a, if, if, if I want to be primarily a listener uh, to social media, I'm going to hear very different things in a, uh, a at, at a content site, say Flickr, as compared with a connection site like Facebook. And those are in no way substitutable, just completely different contexts, giving you completely different information. So again, focusing at the platform level. And then just echoing what I said before, you know, getting out of this mindset of you know, substitutable <coughs> media. They, they, they aren't substitutable. They really work together. Okay. Uh, so, so let me stop here before I beg you for uh, your participation. Um, any, any other questions? Yes. Have there been any studies done talking about the differences between a professional service firm versus, uh, you know, a product company that's selling a product? Um, in, in terms of, no, I haven't seen anything. Um, no, you know, most, most, of, uh, most of these studies are done uh, with, you know, many of them are done with services, you know, but, not, but consumers like restaurants, movies. Uh, things like that, cultural products, where there are lots of conversations. Um, I've seen nothing. I've seen nothing in any B two B setting, uh, generally, and, and, and not uh, specifically within professional services at all. You know, there are there are case studies written, uh, but in terms of sort of a, a broader study, I haven't seen anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, we, we, so based on what I've said, I'm just curious. You know, are there things that you think don't quite well, map in? Or? Like for us. Our whole referral base is attorneys, and you know how do you kind of use the social media in that aspect? I see. Of where, in essence, they're really calling us because of our, usually because of the expert, our personal relationship and contact. They might get our name from another attorney, right? Uh, because you know, who should I call? Right. Uh, so trying to wrap that all up. And, uh, it's interesting. I kind of crossed that line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just as a, as a quick aside, it, it, it's apropos of the network story, but really not having nothing to do with social media. Um, I, I, uh, in my former life, I wrote lots of case studies. Uh, and so I wrote a case study in a law firm in, uh, in Boston, Wilmer Hale. Um, and, uh, and I guess identified this phenomenon that, that seems very, they, they told me it was very common in the law, law firm professional services arena where you have these social networks where uh, <laughs> Attorneys within a, in a specialty, in a, in a practice area, let's say corporate, uh, don't want to refer their clients within the firm to other, say, a tax attorney within their firm. They're more likely to refer them outside the firm or give them recommendations outside the firm. Uh, so it was an interesting, uh, interesting phenomenon. Again, it has nothing to do with social media, but it was a, it was a social network uh, 
interesting social network uh, phenomenon. But to answer your question, no. Yes. Um, for your last slide, you talked about being a listener mm -hmm. or being uh, an influencer. Influencer. Yep. That's that correct. Yep. And one of the ways to be to influence is to have a two-way conversation. No. So I would say, that, and then oh, the, so, the so, so so I, these roles sort of go. Um, they, they progress from more passive to more active. The most active is as a participant. Uh, and they also progressed, from my perspective, in, in terms of risk. You know, the, easy, the easiest thing to do is just be a listener. There's no risk in some sense, right? Uh, you begin to influence. You, you worry a little bit about um, appearing too heavy-handed or what have you. And then once you establish yourself as, as wanting to engage the, the, um, the market in a discussion, you really open yourself up for lots of uh, demands, uh, expectations by, by the market. So, so, so the participant was, in it, it was the third role. The, well, can, the most can you give examples of where one would create a two-way conversation? Twitter, you know, I mean, Twitter, Facebook. So, so Twitter. So take, um, you know, JetBlue, for example, has a really nice Twitter engagement strategy where um, they have a team of four or five. I'm not sure exactly organizationally, but you know, a, a small team of people that that monitor that that. Um, uh, are posting things like flight changes or changes to the rewards program, whatever. Um, but on an ongoing basis, people are, are posting things about JetBlue, so they're constantly monitoring the JetBlue hashtag or any, any references to JetBlue and responding uh, where appropriate. Um, helping people if their flight was canceled. You know, I'm sitting in an airport in, in Dayton, you know, uh, my f JetBlue flight was canceled, what the hell am I going to do? Uh, so where possible helping them. But, but again, you can see that once you do this, in real time, you're setting up expectations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you do it right and you do it resources to it, it can be quite powerful. Um, Facebook is another one. You know, you're setting up a fan page, not just for fans to talk to each other, uh, but moderating it and you know, and and posting and responding. But again, I'd say you're setting up significant expectations, and it's not something to do, you know, passively. You, you really have to make sure you're doing it right. Are you suggesting that? Um one of the more effective ways for generating incremental sales with this, i.e. improving market share, is to be able to identify new customers that have had positive experiences? To focus, uh, certainly, I mean, that, that's certainly one way. I, I, I don't, not best, but, but, but certainly a way that I would focus on that as opposed to this sort of CRM idea of identifying my, uh, Evangelists or something, not, not, and those, and they're great too. But I, my marginal dollar, I would spend a little bit more on those newer customers. Yeah, exactly right. Yep. Uh, so there's a lot of buzz about uh, social media companies and going IPO. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give your opinion on perhaps uh, LinkedIn and their future business? I mean, this, this is on video. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, here's what I would say. I, you, know, I, you know, I think. Um, one of the dangers, to me, one of the dangers of um, you know, the social networking business is that it's it's uh, you know winner take all, uh, and uh, but I think that's only in in the short term, and so I don't think that I would make any assumption that because LinkedIn and Facebook are so dominant today, um, that you know even five years from now that they'll be nearly nearly as dominant. Uh, I think uh, tastes change, and you know, I look at. Um, I can't imagine my daughter is going to want to be on Facebook when I'm on Facebook. You know what I mean? Uh, and so I can't imagine that, well, let me put it this way. I can easily see uh, another, uh, another network um, rivaling or overtaking uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, perhaps more Facebook than LinkedIn, um, you know, over the relatively near, near term. You know, I'm saying five, five six years. So I, that, that's my only comment I can make. You know, I wouldn't make any assumption that, that the winner today will be the winner uh, tomorrow. That's, I have no idea. I'm not, I'm not a finance professor. <laughs> yes? I have a question about tone and content. So you get, you know, you're promoting your product to your business. You get on Twitter or on Facebook, and you, know, you want to promote whatever it is you're selling. What is the fine line? Have you done any research on the line that you have to walk with? Pushing your product, but also being somewhat genuine, so you don't alienate the people you're trying to get. 
Uh, you know, I, I would go back to um, what I was saying before in terms of the, you know, why do people use, why, why are people going to Twitter? Uh, it's certainly not to learn about your product, right? Um, or I shouldn't say certainly, maybe your product. But in general, people aren't going to hear people selling their product. They're looking for um, either content or more likely pointers to where they should look for interesting, interesting content. And so, you know, so the answer would be you have to you think about how you're going to give that to them. How do you satisfy those? Those motivations, and so, you know, establishing uh, what kind of business are you, are you well, in? I work for a trade association. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay, okay. But 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 uh, either developing your own content to point people towards that's that's of interest to them, in a broader context outside of just your business, um, and um, and pointing them to that as well as other content uh, uh, that you know uh, it would be of interest to them. You know, an interesting company um, that does this is and I'm. I'm, I'm at a lot can access. It's interesting. Uh, interesting. B, you know, B two B firm. We were talking about B two B. B two B firm called Can Access. They do. You know, nothing could be more boring. Their business is like supply chain logistics or supply chain supply chain logistics software. Like three things that are boring: right? supply chain, <laughs> logistics, and software. Right? Um, and I guess supply chain is logistics. Whatever. It's a very tedious business. But but nonetheless, I mean, they they they've put together this amazing social media strategy where they've created their own content. So they have a YouTube series that is really compelling. I mean, just go to YouTube and check out Connexus. It's really good. Uh, and so people go go for the content. They've established a community about supply chain logistics. So it's it has nothing to do. I mean, it's not about their company. It's about the industry, and it's a place for people to go for compelling. Uh, information about their industry, right? Um, and so, so again, so I, I think that balance, it's very clear, I think that balance has to be toward giving them interesting content about the, what, they're, uh, what they're looking for, not about your company. Uh, otherwise, nobody's going to, you know, they're going to block you on Twitter and nobody wants to hear it. So, yes? So, just a really oh. good question about... Yeah, oh. No, good. Yes. Um, about celebrity. So I was thinking about commodity products, and if... So if a, a celebrity tries a commodity type product um, and they tweet about it, mm -hmm. are there any studies out yet that, that talk about that? So it's that like the celebrity story? tweets, the sponsor mm -hmm. tweets. You know, I mean, there's lots of studies that show that it matters in terms of traditional marketing. Um, you know, my, my hunch is it does matter because just because they have more followers. Um, you know, whether conditional on followers, uh, it, it matters. I don't know. My hunch is it does. I haven't seen any studies, but I can't imagine it wouldn't matter. You know, given how stupid we all are and, you know, you know if, if somebody, right, I mean, you know, beer, you know, manufacturers know that if they, you know, pay for a celebrity endorser, it does, it works. Uh, and so I can't imagine it wouldn't work equally in, in social media. I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't seen studies, but my hunch would be that it, that it does, yeah. So I'm interested to learn if you've had any feedback in your research as a business once we identify these new customers, for example, that mm -hmm. are happy. Mm -hmm. We kind of walk that fine line asking them, talk about us. Mm -hmm. We don't want to pay them to mm -hmm. talk about us. We want to encourage them to talk about us. Sure. And how do we, how, what's their comfort level? Right? So, you it's interesting you say that. So, so another, I mean, obviously I, I only talked a little bit about each study, but um, so it turns out another thing we looked at in that study wa were individual level differences in these new customers. And so um, did they see themselves as opinion leaders uh, in, in, that, uh, in, the, in that category? Uh, and it turns out if they saw themselves as opinion leaders in that category, in this study, and you know, the results aren't exactly aligned, it wasn't so good. So, so in other words, if you're an, an opinion leader in that category, you're less like, comfortable talking about a new experience you had. So if I see myself as a restaurant expert, right, um, I don't really want to talk so much about new, a new restaurant I went to because I'm not quite sure. I have a reputation to uphold, and so I'm less comfortable talking about that. Um, whereas, on one hand, whereas it turns out um, another measure we looked at was just how many friends you have. So um, you know, if you b buy into sort of this Gladwell idea of connectors and mavens, uh, you know, sort of maps in that if you're more of a connector, lots of lots of friends and acquaintances, you are you are much more excited about about talking about it. So, so if you're if you have a new business, so what this would imply is that if you have a new business uh, and you want to uh, or, or you want to focus on these new customers to talk about your product, you're you're better focusing in that context on people just with more connections. 
Uh, how do we ask? How do we ask? Well, so, so uh, again, so the, the offer, the appeal, as I said, should be more around, um, you know, appealing to their, um, their, their not, not to their altruism, but to their, uh, what it would say about them to their, to their friends. Uh, uh, you know, it'll make you look like somebody who, you know, can identify new restaurants. It'll make you look like somebody who has, you know, great taste in XYZ, whatever, um, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to, um, uh, you know, help out your help out your friend. I don't know. Does that help at all? Or? Yeah, just a little. Let's talk. Let, let's talk. Um, we, we'll talk afterwards. I'll, I'm happy to give you whatever advice I, I can come up with. So one more question, and then uh, I had one more slide. Yeah. And, you know, we have um, a little over 30 viewerships here in the area. And we're really getting into this whole social media. And we do, we, I think we're pretty good at what we do. The biggest challenge we've had in our industry is getting our associates to understand that um, it's not about selling the product. It's not about making the product. It's not about signing the product. And I'm listening to a lot of questions where everybody's still kind of, not everybody, but there's a lot of comments where People are still trying to figure out. Well, how do I, how do I, you know, merge my advertising into that? Don't you think that it should be something totally separate? Or I think it offends people when we try to come by now. Let me tell you why through a social. So social media. No, I agree, and and and, and um, that's not why people are coming to social media, yeah. right? Um, and, and, and you could say that. I mean, the same really, the same holds true for TV, you know, traditional media as well. I mean, it's not, I don't watch a football game to be sold beer, right? But uh, you expect that. But I expect it, right? So we've evolved this, this expectation, and that hasn't occurred, at least yet, right, in, um, in, in social media. No, I, I totally agree. And I think the, the better strategy is to think about why they're coming to each of these platforms and making sure that you're giving them what they're, what they're looking for, whether, whether, again, whether it's content or some sort of social, social experience. I'll give you an example of the... Uh, of um, the the connection, uh, uh, so so on Facebook. So as, as I said, Facebook advertising is is a bit of a mixed bag for a lot of firms. Um, a lot of people I've talked to it really hasn't worked so well. Uh, an example of one where it has worked well is a company um, uh, called Tough Mudder. Has anybody heard of Tough Mudder? Yes. All right. All right. Uh, so Tough Mudder is a, a former student of mine started this company, uh, and it's an event company, and it's basically they run these in, these these endurance events uh, where you, I don't know, you, have you done it? No, uh, I have okay, not. I okay, just great. recently found okay, out about okay, it. Okay, okay. So now you all know about it. Uh, so, you know, you sort of run through, uh, it's like a seven mile run in freezing cold and low voltage wires you have to run through. <laughs> 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 I'm not joking. Burning uh, obstacles you have to run through. It's, it's really awesome. Uh, but, but it's a social event. So you do it so that they don't time it. You do it in a team with a bunch of your friends. Uh, so a lot of, so it's basically targeting people who see themselves as tough, um, very social. So a lot of uh, police officers, firemen, fraternities, military, that's their target. And so they've had tremendous success uh, on, on Facebook. Uh, and, and the CEO, the founder, explained to me that he believes that the reason for this is that you know, people are going to Facebook uh, to express a, sort of a social need. They want to connect with people. Uh, and that's exactly what they deliver. And so, you know, you see an ad for, for Tough Mudder, you know, you and your buddies should go do this together. Um, it fits in exactly with what you're thinking about. Whereas, if you go to Facebook craving that experience and you're told to buy, uh, why you should buy a Volkswagen or something like that, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. Uh, and so, again, you know, my main point is think about why people are coming uh, and, uh, and craft your strategy around delivering that to them. Okay. Let, me, let me finish here. Um, as I said, just by, by admitting that I, you know, I and, and I would argue m most of the people in this field, or, or all the people in this field, can't answer all these questions. You know, we've only been studying it uh, for a few years. Um, you know, compared, we've been tr studying traditional marketing for 50, 60 years. Uh, so there are many unanswered questions. And, uh, you know, just a few of them here, uh, and perhaps I have unanswered them today. Um, you know, how do you integrate, uh, I guess it's a very similar question uh, was asked here at the end, how do we integrate social media and traditional media, right? Um, how should we organize the firm to, to deal with social media? Should we have a social media group? Um, should it be part of every uh, uh, department in the, in the firm? Um, what links exist between online and offline? You know, how should we, how should we think about that? Uh, really interesting question, I think, is 
how does the act of participating in social media affect my opinion? So if I, if I um, participate in a, an online community around a brand, does it change how I view the brand? Does it make me more loyal, less loyal? Um, and again, so at the end of the day, what should you do, right? What's the, uh, what's the optimal strategy? And so as I've already alluded to, I would ask, you know, if anybody has any interest in participating in research of, of this kind and willing to uh, engage in, in some sort of field experiment with your product, with your customers, and we wouldn't hurt them in any way, uh, we would uh, we'd be very much uh, appreciative. So I will stop there. Uh, please stay in touch, and I will hang out. And again, if, I, I'd be happy to answer more questions or, or just chat a little bit uh, afterwards. So thank you.